fourteenth lecture on natural response of second order circuits continued. We have been discussing two cases that is capital D greater than 0. In this case there are no oscillations. The solution consists of the sum of two exponentials e to the minus s1 t and e to the minus s2 t where s1 and s2 are both real and negative all right e to the s1 t minus e to the s2 t a1 plus a2 this is the solution where s1 and s2 are both negative there are no oscillations so the current starts from 0 attains a maximum and then goes to 0. On the other hand if d is less than 0 then we have oscillations we have we have uh, v0 by L omega 0 e to the minus alpha t sin of omega 0 t all right. The border line between these two or the transition case which is which happens at d equal to 0 occurs obviously when r squared by 4 L squared is equal to 1 over L c all right. This is a very special condition and the condition on the resistance r to satisfy this is called are critical it is a critical value of resistance for which this shall be true all right if the if this equality becomes an inequality there shall be either oscillations or no oscillations and therefore this is a critical case and this case is called the case of critical damping critical damping that is if the damping is slightly less then there shall be what there shall be oscillations if the damping is slightly less there shall be oscillations alpha is the damping coefficient if the damping is slightly more there shall be no oscillations and therefore this case d greater than 0 is called an over damped case over damped means no oscillations in the natural response and naturally d less than 0 should be called an under damped case all right under damped case and d equal to 0 is the so called critical damping case critical damping it determines the boundary between oscillations and no oscillations. Let us see what the solution to this case is. Our S12 was equal to minus R by 2L and since capital D equal to 0 there is nothing else plus minus 0 and therefore the two roots are now coincident, coincident on if you take the sigma g omega S plane coincident where on the negative real axis there are two roots at this distance is equal to r by 2L. The two roots are no longer complex, they are both negative real and they are coincident. Now what is the solution under this condition? Obviously if you take our general solution, if you recall e to the S1 t plus A2 e to the S2 t and if S1 is equal to S t, obviously the two solutions are no longer independent of each other. Is not that right? They are, they are identical solutions in fact except for the for the constants a1 and a2. Well if s1 and s2 are equal I can always write this, write this as a1 plus a2 e to the let us say s1 t if s1 is equal to s2 and therefore this cannot represent the general solution. The general solution must have two arbitrary constants because it is a second order system it must have two arbitrary constants and the two solutions should be independent of each other. They should be independent solutions and as you know, as you know in the solution of differential equations, the solution in this case shall be given by A1 plus A2 times T e to the power let us say S1 or S2, S1 T all right. This is the general form of the solution. If under the uh, this is the case for critical damping that is that is capital D equal to 0 or which means that R squared 
equal to well r would be equal to r square by 4 l squared r would be equal to twice square root of l by c is that correct all right so this value of resistance is called the critical value of resistance is r critical and under this condition this will be the general solution now if i apply the initial conditions that is i0 equal to 0 then obviously you see a1 should be equal to 0 is that right if i put t equal to 0 here then obviously a1 is equal to 0 and therefore my i of t shall be equal to a2 t e to the power s1 t the second boundary condition second initial condition is that l di dt l di dt at t equal to 0 should be equal to v0 should be equal to v0 if i differentiate this then i get l a2 t s1 e to the s1 t plus e to the s1 t <coughs> that should be equal to v0 at t equal to 0. I have differentiated this, this expression and I have to put t equal to 0. If I do that, then what do I get as a2? a2 is v0 by L. No longer omega 0 comes, all right. a2 is v0 by L, which means that my total solution is given by v0 by L t e to the s1 t where s1 is equal to minus r by 2l this is the solution to the equation when the two roots are coincident for example if l is equal to 1 henry and c equal to 1 quarter farad what should be the r critical twice square root of l by c Pardon? 4 ohms. In other words, if R is greater than 4, then this case will be which one? Over, under, over damped. If R is equal to 4 ohms, of course, this cors corresponds to critically damped case, critically damped case. And if R is less than 4, then this is the under damped case. All right. Now let us look at this situation. Let us look at this situation in the S plane, all right, the complex plane. And I will repeat, I will repeat what I have been saying in terms of the complex plane. You see, if I have, I have three situations. One is capital D, capital D greater than 0, capital D less than 0 and capital D equal to 0, all right. And the roots of the characteristic equation, let me show the axis sigma j omega, j omega sigma, sigma j omega, there are three cases. And you see in the first case D less than 0 there are two negative real roots minus s1 and minus s2 in the second case that is the under damped case we have two complex conjugate roots where this distance this point is minus alpha and this point is j omega 0 this point is minus j omega 0 all right minus alpha plus minus j omega 0 on the other hand, if I have the critically damped case, then the two roots coincide on the negative real axis. All right, is that okay? Let us consider a fourth case, a fourth case in which capital R equal to 0. Can you tell me where the roots should be? On the imaginary axis, okay. Can you tell me the value? 1 by LC. In terms of omega n, it is j omega n. Is that okay? Right? Now, I want you to look at this figure carefully. If the, if the figure is too small on the monitor, I can draw it again in last version. Can you 
can you see distinctly from the last page okay now <coughs> look at this case d less than 0 this is omega 0 and this distance is alpha so what is the distance of the root from the origin <laughs> omega not squared plus alpha squared is not this simply equal to omega m squared ok now <coughs> omega m depends on l and c only is not that right omega m does not depend on r is that clear by definition omega m is the undamped natural frequency of oscillation <coughs> and undamped means r equal to 0 it is this omega n we are talking of on the other hand both alpha and omega 0 naturally depend on r is that clear because alpha depends on r alpha is equal to r by 2 l therefore omega 0 depends on r omega 0 squared after all is omega n squared minus alpha squared is that clear I am trying to introduce a concept so please be with me what I have said is omega m is independent of r alpha as well as omega 0 depend on r and therefore if I take a circuit if I take a second order circuit c l and r and if I adjust r if I adjust r how do the roots change how do the roots change all right this is what I want to find out suppose I wish to draw the roots of the characteristic equation on the s plane then when r is equal to 0 when r is equal to 0 start from the 0 value it cannot go below 0 all right when r is equal to 0 where are the roots roots are on the imaginary axis at plus minus j omega n is that okay when r is slightly increased what happens to the roots they move to the left half plane this is the right half plane this is the left half plane they move to the left half plane such that the distance of the root distance of either root from the origin remains a constant and if that constant is equal to omega n and therefore the movement of the roots shall naturally be on a semicircle where this distance is omega n all right is that clear as r is increased this this point corresponds to r equal to 0 and as r is increased the roots the two roots this root moves in this direction and this roots this root moves in this direction such that they are always complex conjugates but they must remain on the circle all right now when the roots approach each other and meet on the negative real axis what is the situation the two roots have coincided and therefore capital R must have reached its critical value so this point shall correspond to R equal to twice square root of L by C where the roots become coincident roots are no longer complex they are real negative and coincident all right what happens after this they move on the real axis well what happens is you recall that the roots are minus r by 2l plus minus square root of r by 2l whole squared minus 1 over lc now when capital d this point corresponds to capital d equal to 0 all right that means the roots are at minus r by 2l now when resistance increases further what happens is that this minus r by 2l is either added to a quantity less than it or subtracted that is a negative quantity which is less than it is added to it what does it mean it means that the roots one of the roots goes towards the origin and the other root goes towards infinity 
all right if capital r is increased beyond the critical value the two roots the case is that of over damped case and the two roots move along the negative real axis the roots always remain negative real one increases in magnitude the other decreases in magnitude the one that decreases naturally goes towards the origin and the one that increases goes towards infinity all right this can also be seen from the analytical expression try to follow this very carefully when capital r tends to infinity when capital r tends to infinity one of them one of the roots should be one by lc naturally can be neglected then and therefore one of the roots should be minus r by 12 minus r by 12 and the other root would be minus r by 12 plus r by 12 so one of the roots goes to the origin the other goes to infinity is that clear okay so both from the analytical expression from explanation and from the figure you can see that the locus of the two roots is given by this semicircle and then two straight lines one going towards the origin the other going towards infinity and this picture this picture which gives the motion of the roots or the locus of the roots as one of the parameters capital r changes in the circuit this picture is called a root locus for obvious reason it describes the locus of the roots as one of the parameters that is capital r changes now if you argue what is so secret about capital r why don't you keep r constant and vary l we can again obtain another sketch which will not be exactly this it will be another sketch but you can draw it and i leave that to you as an exercise once again you can obtain a critical damping condition and under damped condition and an over damped condition you can also draw a root locus for variation of capital c capital c can also vary and this would be a third kind of sketch now is this point clear the concept of root locus the concept of over damping under damping and critical damping all right usually in measuring instruments in measuring instruments which can be usually modeled as a second order system what do you think we should have as far as damping is concerned critically damped, critically damped. well uh, why not under damped let's so understand if, if we have an under damped system mm -hmm. then it keeps oscillating about the exact about the actual position and we don't get the uh, exact value in a small time that's right it takes quite a bit of time the needle goes on oscillating and then finally it settles to some value whereas if it is critically damped critically damped then it it reaches the final value all right if it is over damped then it takes a very long very time. long time to reach a steady state and therefore these concepts are important the concept of root locus as we shall see um, is extremely important arises in control systems um, arises in uh, in many other physical systems <coughs> the other concept that is of extreme importance is that of impedance and this is time that we introduce this concept impedance i shall first give a formal definition yeah Oh, second order it shows the locus of the roots <coughs> as one of the parameters is varying. So that's okay. That's obvious. But I mean, what what is its importance? No, so what is its importance? Thing? Well, um, as you shall see later, if you are a mechanical engineer, uh, in control systems, in any process control, for example. Uh, which can be modeled as a second order or third order or fourth order system suppose the roots one of the roots due to a disturbance in a parameter goes to the right half plane if the root locus includes the right half plane what will happen or the imaginary axis 
then what will happen? Suppose the parameter is such that the, the roots are on the imaginary axis, then the instrument or the process that you are uh, experimenting with will never settle down, it will go on oscillating, isn't that right? So the root locus shows the locus of the roots and your design should be such that the roots are in the left half plane. For example, it is not always true that in all physical systems we require a critically damped case. No, sometimes a bit of oscillation is necessary. Why? If you want a quick response, well, after a couple of oscillations it stays, it settles. So a little bit of damping, a little bit of under damping is quite in order. So the root locus shows where to locate your roots. And if you know where to locate your roots, then the system design is obvious, all right? So this is the purpose of the root locus. Root locus is an analytical tool for designing a system. I have drawn the root locus of a second order system. There can be third order, fourth order. Usually natural uh, systems, practical systems are, of, are usually uh, second or higher order systems. And the root locus is essential for determining the design criteria. Where should you locate the roots? in order to satisfy what you want, in order to satisfy your requirements. Is that okay? Any, any other question regarding root locus? All right. Next, we introduce the, the, the concept of impedance. The, the introduction or the definition that I am going to give you now would be a bit uh, heuristic, a bit inaccurate, a bit unsophisticated but this will serve our purpose at the present moment. The, the definition of impedance is like this, consider a two terminal network, a network which is only two terminals, all right? And you consider a linear network, all right? A linear network. Then you know that all that you can do is to is to connect a voltage generator and measure the current. The excitation would be a voltage generator, the response would be a current or you could connect a current generator here and measure the voltage, all right? Now if you, if your, if your excitation, either a current generator or a voltage generator is of the form of e to the st and this network is a linear network, contains resistance capacitance and inductance, then you know the differential coefficient of e to the st is also of the form of e to the st, s times e to the st. The integral of e to the st is also of the form e to the st. So if you apply a voltage generator here, which is of the form e to the st, the current shall also be of the form e to the st. Isn't that right? Similarly, if you apply a current generator, which is of the form of e to the st, the voltage developed across this shall also be of the form e to the st. And therefore, the ratio of v by i, the ratio of v by i shall be a constant, but it will depend on the value of s. And therefore, this is denoted by capital Z of s. And this is called the impedance. I must caution you, so uh, let me first define it. The impedance of a, any two terminal, any linear two terminal network is the ratio of voltage to current provided the excitation, either the voltage or the current, excitation under bracket, the either the voltage or the current is of the form of e to the power st. Is that clear? It is not true for any arbitrary excitation. Excitation must be exponential. Only then the ratio of V to I is called an impedance. Let us take an example. Is the definition clear? The exponential excitation is an integral part of this definition. If that part is taken out, then it does not make sense. All right. For example, if I take a resistance, let us say a two terminal network, a pure resistance R, then you know V is equal to IR. 
and if V is of the form of E to the ST, I is E to the ST divided by R. If I is of the form of E to the ST, then V is E to the ST multiplied by R and V by I is equal to R. This is a constant independent of S, all right? This is a constant independent of S. On the other hand, if I have an inductor L, V and I, then you know V is equal to L di dt and therefore if I is of the form of E to the ST, then V by I shall be equal to S times L. So the impedance of an inductor of value L is simply equal to S times L, all right? What is the dimension of S? 1 by time, which means S is a frequency and S could be real or complex, all right? So in general, small s is a complex frequency, real frequency, real quantity is a special case of a complex quantity, isn't that right? So if, if, if you view life as complicated, this is the most general situation. If you take the imaginary part out, life becomes simple, all right? So s is a complex frequency and the impedance of a, of a inductor ZL of s is equal to S times L. If I take a capacitor C, you know the current I equal to C dV dt and if V is of the form of E to the ST, then Z of S is given by 1 over S times C. This is the impedance of a capacitor ZCS, all right? And once <coughs> the impedance is defined for inductor and capacitor, you can treat inductors and capacitors exactly like resistances, all right? The impedance of a resistance is R, the impedance of an inductor is S times L, the impedance of a capacitor is 1 by SC and if you have let's say a series combination of R, L and C, then your V shall be equal to drop across R plus drop across L plus drop across C and if you take the voltage or the current of the form E to the ST, you can show that Z of S here of R, L and C in series is simply given by R plus SL plus 1 over SC. That is these quantities can now be added, all right? Similarly, suppose I have a circuit like this, R, L and C. Suppose I have another combination. This is not a series combination. It is a series connection of R with a parallel connection of L and C, if this is V and this is I and one of them is exponential, then the impedance of the circuit can be written, the manipulation will be exactly like that of resistances. Here an impedance SL is in parallel with an impedance of 1 by SC and therefore it is R plus SL times 1 by SC R1 R2 divided by R1 plus R2. Now instead of R you say Z, the impedance. So Z1, Z2 divided by Z1 plus Z2 that is SL plus 1 over SC which is equal to R plus SL divided by S squared LC plus 1. Now you ask me what is the use? Why should we do that? Well if we do this, if we define an impedance, one of the advantages is that all kinds of circuits can now be treated in exactly the same manner that you have treated a resistive circuit. For example, Thevenin's theorem. With this definition of impedance, now Thevenin's theorem is applicable to RLC circuits also, Thevenin's Norton's. And we can also do circuit analysis without writing a differential equation. Once the impedance concept is introduced, DDT shall be replaced by S 
and integral shall be replaced by 1 over s e to the st dt integral is e to the st over s d dt of e to the st is s times e to the st all right let's take a specific example before we close this class yes please do combining networks you see if you simply want to charge a capacitor now here e to the st does not come into effect because your voltage your source is a constant it's not of the form e to the it is e to the st with s equal to 0 and therefore you cannot introduce impedance concepts here all right impedance concept will come only when the source is an exponential let us take one example, let us take the same circuit that we have been talking of, let us say R, L and C. Now please, please pay your attention to this, we are doing something new, all right. The, uh, suppose R equal to 2 ohms, L equals to 1 Henry and C equals to 1 quarter farad, all right and this V this V is given as 6 e to the minus 2 T. Is not it of the form of exponential? It is an exponential with S equal to minus 2. So, if I wish to find this current let us say I for example, then what I do is I first find out Z of S. Z of S as you have seen already is R plus S L divided by s squared l c plus 1. Now, substitute the values. z of minus 2, all right, would be equal to 2 plus s is minus 2 multiplied by 1 divided by s squared is minus 2 squared times 1 times 1 quarter plus 1 which means z of minus 2 equal to how much? 1. one. All right. z of minus 2 is equal to 1. So, what do you think this current shall be then? v by i is z of s. So, so it will also be 6 e to the power minus 2 t. Is that clear? Is it minus? No, it is plus. i shall be equal to v divided by z of minus 2 and therefore it is 6 e to the minus 2 t. What do you think this voltage shall be V1? It would be V minus I R. So, what would this be? V is so this would be minus 6 e to the minus 2 t. I know this voltage. If I know this voltage, do I know this current I L? I L shall be equal to this voltage divided by S L, where S shall be equal to minus 2. Do I know this current I C? Yes, it would be C D V D T, C D V D T that is the differentiation of this. So, I know all currents and voltages in this circuit. You see, the excitation was exponential. I did not have to write a second order differential equation. Normally, yeah. You wanted to ask a question? Normally, in a circuit like this, I have to write a differential equation and then solve it. That is, write a1 e to the s1 t plus it. I did not have to do anything like that because I recognize that the, that the excitation is exponential. And if the excitation is exponential, I can work purely in terms of impedances. All right. I will just, uh, five minutes, I uh, will just introduce another term to you. It is admittance. I told you impedance is the ratio of voltage to current. 
the reciprocal of an impedance is the admittance. Admittance is one over impedance. Sometimes it is easier to work in terms of admittance rather than impedance. And it is with this that we conclude the class today.